and we invited uh, tonight uh, Miriam Rose that works uh, for Foil Vedanta and was instrumental um, to in in the case of uh, communities uh, suing basically a, a mining company Vedanta on uh, pollution of the river uh, in uh, in Zambia. I would like to say that. Miriam is an alumni of Sussex, which is uh, quite a nice uh, kind of closing the circle. And I'll hand it over to you, Miriam. So maybe we talk a little bit about your work and how did you come into uh, work on environmental, because there are some students and researchers, it will be quite interesting to link academic, academic experience with activism and, and the methodology that uh, you developed. Mm, yes, sure. So hi, hi everyone. Really nice to be virtually with you. It'd be nicer to be with you in person. Um, yeah, I suppose my entry into activism was through student activism at Sussex, which was, as, as it still is, one of the, in fact, that's the reason that I went to Sussex University. My dad, who was also an uh, environmental activist, said it's got the best student politics in the country. <laughs> um, and I got involved with the student union and a friend and I set up the Environmental Society. And, you know, through our journey at the university, we kind of, you know, we educated ourselves about activist methodology and, you know, ended up getting very involved in direct action. And then through that, through, through a talk I've given at Sussex, I ended up moving to Iceland where um, aluminium companies, a group of international aluminium companies um, had captured the Icelandic government to build huge hydropower dams all over the country to feed aluminium smelters. So I spent three years there um, opposing that and really, really learning a lot about the, the, how the metals and industry works globally um, and uh, um, the, the finance industry, um, the impact of large dams, the impact of aluminium industry. And that was successful. We actually stopped all the, all the different um, uh, dams that were gonna be built apart from one which was already in progress when we, when we started. And it was through living in Iceland that I met Samarendra Das, who is the person who set up Foil Pedanta, and he'd been campaigning on a whole load of issues in India, but also against this company, Vedanta, who were operating in the area that he's from, um, trying to mine an indigenous mountain, a mountain lived on by a very small indigenous group for bauxite, for aluminium. So when I left Iceland and moved back to the UK, I, I naturally started working with him because I already had this knowledge of the metals industry, the aluminium industry, and we kind of built up what he'd started together, Foil Vedanta, um, which was, Foil is a joke on the, on aluminium, of course, because they're initially an aluminium company. So, you know, aluminium foil and foiling Vedanta. And um, the campaign had started, had been, had been focused around this issue in Niamgiri, in, in, uh, which I'm sure you've all heard of. There's another talk, I think, I think um, Zuki is giving a talk about Niamgiri also. So this was a, a massive global campaign, became a massive global campaign, started as a total grassroots struggle and Samarendra was one of the people supporting and linking with the Dongria Khan people who opposed this mine. And it became global, it became globalised through the grassroots movement reaching out through Samarendra and also through NGOs then getting on board. And that's a whole other story. Um, but the end of that story is that they succeeded in stopping that mine by a precedent legal process, a combination of activism, forcing the courts into making a precedent decision about free prior informed consent, about um, allowing all the communities who lived on the mountain, all the indigenous to vote whether for or against the mine, which they unanimously voted against. So really where I'm, what I'm gonna talk about this evening, which is about our work in Zambia, comes off the back of that. You know, that, that we just had that victory, just had that victory when we first went to Zambia. So there was a sense of, wow, we can do it, you know, grassroots movements, something that starts from a group of, of, of tribal people can change the law, you know, and can, and, and can save their mountain. And that was a message we, we wanted to take. There was, we were already linked in to other, other places affected by the mining company because they were active all over India and, and Africa, um, already linked, but we deepened those links at that point, really deepened them and started to go out to the communities and say, look, let's share this, share this experience of what happened in Niamgiri, you know, share the knowledge because the communities are all kept separate by, by the way the mining company operates and they're not sharing information between their, between their operations. So you've got 
got this global company with all its multinational um, you know, access to data, access to finance and global links. And then you've got all these communities who are totally isolated. Each one is trying to fight their struggle for the first time. So our job, you know, our idea was to link them with each other. Grassroots to grassroots, we, we call it G to G links um, for short. So link them with each other so that, you know, the people in Tamil Nadu who are affected by the copper smelter can speak to the people in um, in Orissa who are affected by another aluminum smelter and they can share, you know, the patterns and all the rest of it. So linking them up and also bringing the, the information that they didn't have from London because this mining company was now listed in London. So doing the financial research, looking up the shareholders, finding out what they were saying and taking that knowledge into the community so they were armed with information for their struggle and finding lawyers and there's much more to it than that. So it was kind of after that that we started reaching out further. Now it's so nice talking to you. I gave a talk last night and um, it was really difficult sharing my presentation because I couldn't see I couldn't see any of the faces. I was just talking to a blank computer screen. But, so I'm really loath to start sharing my presentation because I'm really enjoying actually seeing your faces, but I probably should share my presentation. So I'll share it now. I might kind of, maybe I'll just kind of move in and out. Um, da, 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 that's the one I want. Okay. Slideshow. Okay, can you see that? Can't can't see anyone, so you'll have to tell me. Yep. I'll presume you can. Oh, anyway, what am I doing? I'm right and I'm in a totally wrong place. Hang on, let me just go back to the beginning. <laughs> good start. Uh -huh. We can see everything. It's okay. Excellent. Good. It's it's just very um disconcerting not knowing what's happening. Right. So I've kind of. I've, I've talked a little bit about who we are. This is a picture of one of our demonstrations in London at, at the AGM. So one of the things we did is every year we went to this company's annual general meeting and activist shareholders went inside the meeting and questioned the, the, the board of directors and shareholders on what was happening, bringing the human rights concerns, you know, up in the meetings that should be recorded. And then there was a big protest outside. So this is one of our banner drops at one of their events. This is just about who Vedanta is. I'm not going to go much into Vedanta, it's something you can look up yourselves, but today I want to really talk about our activist methodology because I want to, you know, I want to talk to you as Sussex students, as people who might be doing development studies about what your roots are if you have interest in these issues in real solidarity. And I think that there's, there's an idea that there's NGO work, there's academic work, but there's not really, there's not many people who are, who are, who are modeling this example of what grassroots solidarity can mean. So that's what I want to focus on. But anyway, Vedanta is a global diversified metals, mining and metals company. They have oil and gas, they've got all different metals. They've got power companies. They're mostly all over India, which is where they're originally from, although they, they listed in London, now they've delisted again. Um, but also, as you can see, Africa and Australia and Ireland. And, you know, again, I won't go into it, but why London? That's an important part of what of you know the work that we do and what I've already said, London that are being listed on the London Stock Exchange gives a company credibility, credibility with investors, credibility with communities where people feel this is a this is a credible company, this is going to be a trustworthy company because they're British, they, it's going to be um, they're going to have regulatory standards, which unfortunately is not the case. They, the London Stock Exchange does not monitor um, the companies adequately. It doesn't look at the at, the human rights abuses and this is what we're trying to expose but it's, it's also more importantly because of the colonial era links between London and you know, the colonial countries but also mining generally. London has always been the center of mining and it still is the center of mining finance so if you're listed in London you can get you can get MPs on your board, you can get former um, ambassadors on your board as Vedanta did and you've got access to, to power basically through the colonial links which go on today. This is just a, an image of the Neam Giri struggle, which I just spoke about. I won't dwell on that. So, okay, so I'm, I'm, what I want to do is just talk you through, let me just look at the time so I don't overspeak. Um, talk you through really our experience in Zambia. I'm just gonna tell the story and I will stop, as if you suggest I kind of stop halfway to see if you're overwhelmed and try and take some questions. Um, uh, yeah, and I put on my notes here to excuse my baby brain. I've got a one year old baby and I don't get much sleep. So sometimes I just can't remember any words. So excuse me if I go blank. I'm doing my best. I've had a cup of tea. Uh, so so what happened in Zambia? So um, Vedanta expanded into Africa 
in in 2004. This was the first mine that they bought in in Africa. This and it's the biggest copper mine in Zambia. It's one of their key. And Zambia's the second largest copper producing nation in Africa, after Congo. So it's a big, very big mine. It's one of their key assets. And it was broken up when when Zambia was um, became independent, and then very immediately came under the pressure of the IMF and global debt. They're, they're, they were forced to break up their state-owned mining company, which was very profitable, and split it into, into units. And this was the richest unit, which was originally sold to Anglo-American. But Anglo-American mismanaged it, a consortium bought it, and then Vedanta bought it, Anil Agarwal, the boss of Vedanta, bought it in 2004. So we, Samarendra was aware of this, not, not so much me, but he was totally aware of this happening and was already watching Zambia from that point. But there was no news coming out of there. The first news that came was in this report. I want to cite these people because they're a really important part of the story. For whom the wind falls, winners and losers in the privatisation of Zambia's copper mines, which was written in 2007 by two academics from Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, sorry, Oxford and uh, Cambridge and Copper Belt University. So John Lung Lungu from Copper Belt University, Alistair Fraser from Cambridge. And they dissected you know the issues with privatization and then they had this one page on pollution of the of the river Kafue. so that's the first time we that was the, that was the first really um you know global in news about the fact that there'd been a huge pollution incident just two years after they bought this mine but less than two years where you can see in the article here, a thousand times acceptable levels of copper, 77,000 times levels of manganese and 10,000 times acceptable levels of cobalt was spilt into the river Kafue. And it was spilt for, for 48 hours. They let it run, basically let pure acid run into this river. And more than 40,000 people were affected downstream. So that's the first time it hit international news and, and nothing was done. Oops, wrong button. Oh, what's going on? Why can't I go to the next page? Oh. Oh, oh seems to have frozen. There we go. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, okay. Um, so, so, yeah, that was out there, but there was no news about it. The next news that came up internationally was in 2011. This amazing news that the Zambia courts had um, forced the mining company to pay $2 million for the pollution. So this is amazing, really, in, in Africa, in countries where you think, God, you know, there'll be no justice for these mining companies. And in fact, again, when, um, when various structural adjustment policies, and Zambia was like an experiment for just structural adjustment. So when structural adjustment was, was forced on Zambia, one of the parts of that was to reduce their, their laws, just, you know, strip their laws down to very minimums. There was very little environmental regulations the laws were very minimal so you think god they'll never be able to hold these companies to account but they did and this amazing news came through that a group of people a group grassroots group of former miners who were polluted by the company had taken them to court and an amazing judge had ordered them to pay ordered the company to pay two million dollars concola copper mines is the subsidiary for for pollution and um the judge said the courts have a duty to protect poor communities from the powerful and politically connected I agree with the plaintiff's pleadings that KCM was shielded from criminal prosecution by political connections financial and financial influence, which put them beyond the pale of criminal justice. He said, whether human beings had died or not, there was gross recklessness on the part of KCM, which must bear the moral, criminal and civil liability for the appalling tragedy because the company had turned Chingola residents into guinea pigs and showed no remorse. So it's a very strong judgment and, you know, really saying we're not going to be used as guinea pigs by these companies, which was so exciting. So at, at that point, um, Sam Rendra said, and we both said, we have to go, you know, we've got to go and find these people who, who've done this, you know, this is amazing and we've got to support them. Um, I'm just looking at my notes. Um, so we were desperate to get out there, but we, we didn't have, we don't have funds. We don't have many funds because for a good reason, we don't, we are um, operating in a very different way to mainstream NGOs. And there's a problem with the whole funding system. The funding system is makes you accountable mostly to the funders and not to the communities because um, as any of you will know who've done funding applications funders want to know what you're going to do what the outcome is going to be <laughs> likely outcome and when it's you know and when and when that's going to be so that they want a project a nice neat project okay it's you know, this is the problem this is the solution this is what you're going to do that's not the way we operate and that's not the way 
one should operate as a responsive activist, you respond to what's happening. So if the news tomorrow says a pollution incident's happened in Tamil Nadu, whatever, you know, you need to go there or you need to respond. You can't think, oh, well, it would be good to respond, but actually we've already got grant funding for this project. So we've got to carry on doing, doing that instead. So we refuse to take funding, which is strings attached. We refuse to take project-based funding. We need to be flexible. Um, we don't want to be accountable to funders who are very, um, who, are, who, who want to be very involved in the project. We need independence. And also we refuse to partner with NGOs. So the way a lot of small groups do it is they partner with a bigger NGO who says, okay, you can deliver this project. Um, we, we, we already had a lot of critiques of NGOs because of the way that they'd interacted with the communities in Neamgiri where they basically tried to um, co-opt and, and take publicity for the, the tribal uh, struggle there. And they've made a real mess and di created divisions within the community. So we're not prepared to partner with NGOs. So we don't have funds. We, you know, we, we get very small amounts of funding, but we don't let that stop us. So, oh God, what's going on here? I've got to do it like that. Okay. So we decided to raise our own funds, just the old fashioned way. We, we got a little bit of, I think we got a little bit of money from Edge Fund or someone like that. And otherwise we thought we'll do it ourselves. So we do have access to this, um, amazing big house which is which is a benefit through my family and so we we cooked this big Indian meal there that was one of the one of the things we did we cooked this huge Indian meal in this big house we asked for donations I sung a song a sponsored song which people which people donated to um <laughs> and yeah and we managed to raise our budget for for two people for a for a month-long trip in to Zambia was about three to four thousand pounds, which is a fraction of what an NGO would spend on on a trip like that. And we we managed to raise it all through our own means. So that was us completely independent. Oh God, this is really annoying the way it operates. That was us completely. Uh, uh, oh God. Uh, dear, the clicking button's not working. Uh -huh. So that was us basically free to go. Another problem is that many small funders and kind of um, environmental funders won't fund flights. So when we say we need to go, you know, we need, to, we, need, we need money for flights and visas to go to Zambia, many are not willing to, to fund it, which is very short sighted when you think about the size of the issues that we're, that we're dealing with. So, you know, so this was us off. We had no contacts in Zambia as of yet. Um, and, you know, it's, these communities are very isolated. They're not on Facebook or, or whatever. So we had no way of getting in touch. We just used mainstream we kind of rang up mainstream NGOs until somebody basically agreed, you know, knowing our background is kind of quite radical activists, somebody agreed to, um, to, to take us around. We can't afford ho hotels and or whatever, so we depend on staying with people in communities. I mean, we did stay in ch cheap hotels for a, for a part of the trip, but we were dependent on staying with people. So we had this one contact we made on the phone and we went out to meet him in, in the Zambian Copper Belt. And that, was, again, was very interesting because Zambia is a country where the NGO sector is one of the biggest um, sectors of employment, actually. it's. It's mining, then the church, then NGOs. So it's a huge, there's a huge amount of NGOs in Zambia, masses of NGOs in Zambia. Um, and, and this pollution incident was one of the biggest environmental issues to hit Zambia, you know, in decades. Um, and yet nobody, none of them had touched it. None of them had gone to the villages. None of them had done anything about it. Um, so when we said we want to go and meet these people, they were very edgy. And the, the, the person we stayed with, I'm not going to name him, but he was um, related to Southern African Resource Watch, which is an open society um, funded project, it's an open society project, George Soros, you know, based project. So they're very limited in what they can do. And he was very edgy about taking us to communities. They spent a lot of time kind of trying to distract us. <laughs> and eventually they took us to this one place here, it's called Helen Village, we later got to know it much better, which was so poor and, and, and so polluted, you know, and no clean sources of water. And these two men on the right here, you can see the poverty in their faces told us how they had no clean water to drink, that they were drinking, and they knew they were drinking acid water in the stream, but there was nothing else. And how bad the pollution incident was and how even their boreholes are polluted. So there's no, there's no weapon to get clean water from. And we started filming these, these people and getting a little testimony, but we were whisked off by the NGO guy again. Um, he was working with another local, local NGO as well, but they were very touchy. So we, we only got a few minutes there, really. Or we spent an hour there, maybe. But once we started speaking to people, we were whisked away. So that was it. Um, 
then we then later in this uh, same trip, we had one other meeting where we we spoke about Vedanta to a group of um, a, a group of people in a mining township in Kitwe. There's two towns where um, Vedanta has got its copper copper mining operations, Chingola and Kitwe. So in, in Kitwe, we spoke to a room of people, and at the back there were these amazing former miners. The, the three uh, on the left that you see, the, the guy on the right is another young student. Um, so they're former KCM miners. They were retrenched by um, Vedanta, you know, made made redundant, and they'd never received their dues, never received their pensions or their or their, their proper payment. And they've been fighting for justice ever since. So they were they started talking up and speaking up in the meeting and saying, uh, you, you know, telling their story and saying this company is corrupt and making these accusations. And immediately the N another NGO who was hosting the meeting started to silence them. Oh, don't speak ill of the mining company if they're not here to answer back. So we could see how oppressed people were by the NGOs, how because of their funders, which mostly, you know, NGO funding comes from aid agencies and most a lot of the aid ag agencies in Zambia uh, is British. So and this is a British company. You know, so um, people were not able to speak freely. Their activism was not happening, and NGOs were playing the role of, of, of repressing and quietening the kind of righteous anger that's coming up from the grassroots. Anyway, again, we, we got outside the meeting and we just managed to take their details before knowing now that the NGOs wouldn't be happy. We just managed to get their details scribbled down a piece of paper before we were whisked off again to be stopped from talking to these kind of, you know, angry miners. And these guys were our, in the end, were our link to everything that happened afterwards. So we're so grateful to them and we're still in touch with them and they're still fighting for justice for their, um, for the 752 of them in their group who never received their proper benefits from the company. How am I doing for time here? Yeah, okay. Okay. I'll look at my notes again because I don't want to miss anything. Yeah, so it was it was through in the end. Well, I explained it but anyway. It was through those miners that we finally got in touch with the communities. So after this, um, we, we then went on to Lusaka and we managed. We we spoke. We just went into everywhere we could. The most shocking thing that we discovered when we got to Zambia is um, is that people thought this company was Indian. The the, the the perception across the country, everyone we met, from journalists, lawyers to communities, NGOs thought that Vedanta is an Indian company because at the time Zambia had a, has a, still has a, a kind of semi-socialist government and they were in their favor of, of kind of unity between um, third world countries. So Indian investors were more welcome at that, at that time than British investors. And Vedanta had portrayed themselves as Indian. So everyone thought this was an Indian company. So one of the first things was to say, no, this is not an Indian company, this is a British company. And that just shocked people to discover how little information they had. Um, and secondly, that the company claimed that they were making a loss. And they had for 10 years. In a couple of years, they made a very small profit. Otherwise, they said, this is not a, this is a loss-making operation. Um, we're making a loss every year. And therefore, they paid zero tax, absolutely zero tax, because that was what was negotiated, again, as part of structural adjustment. The tax rates were very low. Um, but because they were they were claiming a loss, they they weren't paying any tax at all. And on top of that, they didn't publish their annual reports. So the annual reports were not in the public domain as they should be. There was no way of seeing their figures, the figures for KCM, the subsidiary. So we immediately started trying to tell people, look, there's no way this company's making a loss. This is your richest copper asset. And if they were making a loss, they wouldn't have kept it, you know, already for 10 years. Um, this is 2014 when we went. And we said, we can't, we need to get access to the annual reports to, to show how much of a profit they're making. So everywhere we went, we said, you know, does anyone have access to the annual reports? We tried to find it and dig it up and, and we couldn't. And in the end, through, through spreading this information on this short trip, we spoke to lawyers, we spoke to journalists, we spoke to students, academics. In the end, we kind of got, got contacted up to the level of the Deputy Minister of Mines. We spoke to the Deputy Minister of Mines, Richard Masukwa, who is now the Minister of Mines. And we shared with him the information that they're a British company, their shareholders, who the key shareholders are, so who, who the interests are behind them, and assured them that they were not making a loss and that we'd get to the bottom of this. And, and um, so we spread a lot of information, we made some links, and when we got back, we wrote this report, which I still recommend. In fact, I read it again for this talk. And although it's written in 2014, it is still really interesting and relevant report. 
and let's go to the next so this is the contents and what's very important to us firstly is to link to the history um yeah so who ever done to, that's right introduction copper from cape to cairo the introduction was all about um the, the colonial period in zambia and how it's all predicated on on the copper mines um and how how the copper mines were privatized and um and you know extracted as part of copper was extracted as part of colonialism as a key part of colonialism and then how that moved into the privatization that happened so always basing it in the colonial history to understand where we've got to today um, and then this chapter two then this main chapter was about information you know the information that Zambia needs and doesn't have where does you know um, what does copper sell for how much profit are these companies making where is it going because the um the mainstream understanding in Zambia was and and the, and what's and and what was the there gets baby brain kicking in <laughs> and um and the official data was showing that almost all Zambia's copper was being exported to Switzerland now Switzerland doesn't even have a port and obviously is not one of the world's biggest copper buyers but Switzerland is a tax haven so the receipts for copper were being shown in Switzerland but the copper was obviously being sold to China China is the main buyer of copper so already they didn't even know where the copper was going, what price was being achieved for it. There was total opacity, too much opaqueness. And we, we wanted to, to point that out. Um, yeah, and then the, the truth about Vedanta in Zambia, the water pollution, air pollution, workers' rights, and who owns Zambia, where we want to talk about the shareholders behind the company, and also the role of the Department for International Development, which had uh, funded um, and the improvement of the smelters just before just before Vedanta bought bought the mine, Diffid had ploughed a whole load of money into improving the smelters under Anglo-American's ownership. Um, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll maybe come back to that later. And then there's a bit about NGOs. We'll talk about that in a bit. And this was the section in our report. So we did manage to, although we hadn't got access to, to KCM's annual reports, through looking at Vedanta's annual reports. There was a, in, in the very back pages, there was a little breakdown of um, the production levels that went into subsidiaries and the cash costs of production from which you can deduce the profit they're making. So we could deduce roughly that um, KCM was making a $362 million profit annually or that year in Zambia rather than a loss as they claimed. So this, this claim was in our report. Um, see how I'm doing for time here. Yeah, I'll just read you the conclusion so you get a sense of the report. Zambian politicians and newspapers often talk about foreign companies as investors in their country, and companies themselves present their presence in Zambia as a benevolent effort to create jobs, even at their own loss, in the case of Vedanta. This misconception couldn't be further from the truth. Extractive industries come to Zambia to take advantage of low taxes and liberal policies, which allow them to ruthlessly loot and exploit the natural resources, leaving behind corruption and environmental and social damage, which their minimal tax contributions don't come close to compensating. Recent studies have revealed in unequivocal terms that sub-Saharan Africa is a global net creditor of billions of dollars each year, which mostly is in illicit flows of owed taxes, undeclared extraction and corrupted deals. You all know about illicit financial flows um, and why Africa is a net creditor. This is extractivism, not investment or aid. The bottom line is that Zambia's copper-based economy has a finite lifetime, with economists suggesting that Zambian copper will be exhausted between 2020 and 2100. The upper end may be unlikely, as we've shown how companies and financial analysts can manipulate these figures to create investor confidence and enable speculation. At any rate, there is limited time to reverse the trend of losing rather than gaining from this precious resource, making it last or planning for an economy without it. So we didn't give uh, you know, any kind of specific recommendation, do this, do that. We wanted to talk about getting more information about the company, how you think about how you use your resource. Um, I better move on. So. When we launched the report, because we're an activist group, we didn't just launch the report into the ether, we did a protest. So we, we had a big protest outside the Zambian High Commission, calling on the, you know, talking about the key messages in the report, calling on KCM to publish the annual reports. Um, oh, I've missed out a bit here. Um, yeah, calling them to publish the annual reports, to pay the miners who've never received their due and to 
and most importantly, to pay the compensation to the community. So what I missed out is on the very last day of our trip in Zambia, we managed to go and find the lawyer who had taken the case where this community had received allegedly, as we thought, this $2 million in compensation. We'd never managed to meet the people who take the case because the NGO wouldn't give us access and we, we couldn't meet them. Um, but this was still our understanding and, and the understanding in the global media. So we met the, this, their lawyer who said it was never paid. The case, the, the company appealed the case and it's been tied up. Basically, the judicial system has been corrupted and they won't hear the appeal. So therefore, it's just in, in limbo and the money has never been paid. So, you know, this was a real shock to us and we thought, God, this is not over. So we demanded that the, that the um, compensation should be paid. Uh, 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 uh. Miriam, while you are uh, reading. Yeah, go on. Who did, who did you give the report to? Well, um, again, through meeting some, through some of the people we'd met in Zambia, we had access to a really good press list um a really good zambian press list so we we sent it out to all zambian media and it went immediately onto the front pages of newspapers um and through our protest obviously our, the, the the point of a protest is to also get get it into the media so the protest just draws attention to the to the report and it makes its way into the media we also gave a copy you know we, we a delegation went into the zambia high commission during the protest gave a copy of the report and spoke to the to um, not to the actual ambassador, but to one of his deputies. Uh, so we, we distributed it far and wide, but we used protests. We used the activist, you know, part of our, of our scholar activism. You know, we use the activist side of the, the scholarly side to get it circulated. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, and then another, sorry, I'm a bit all over the place here. Another um, shocking part of what we discovered in Zambia was that Clearly, the Zambian Revenue Authority was not able to collect tax from Zambia, who claimed they were, from um, KCM, who claimed they were making a loss when they clearly weren't. However, there was a huge project, again, DFID funded project, DFID and Norwegian government funded project, to help the Zambian Revenue Authority collect more taxes. So, what were they doing? You know, what taxes were they focusing on if they weren't even giving them basic information that these mining companies are clearly making a profit? So, again, you can see the duplicitous role and the kind of yeah, the duplicitous and corrupt role of, of DFID, not, you know, covering up the real issues, preventing the institutions, Zambian institutions, from getting the information that they need. Da, 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 da. Uh, 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 uh. Sorry. Yeah. OK, I'll talk a little bit more, then we'll have, then we'll have a little question break. Um, so... So shortly after our reports, that this the, this is the um, these are some of the headlines in Zambia after our report was released. They called it Coppergate, you know, the information that this company might be making a profit, and of course that related to other mining companies in Zambia as well because they, many of them were claiming a loss. This is a matter of matter of national importance. Um, we've read the report and do not wish to discuss any aspect of it. So Vedanta was KCM was coming back to us saying the report's nonsense um, but others were saying well what's nonsense about it prove it so this was already in the media and then the next thing that happened was just incredible which was that we found through some contact somebody mentioned that Anil Agarwal was speaking in Bangladesh to a in, in, not in Bangladesh sorry in Bangalore to a group of businessmen and as usual um, Samarendra in particular just trawls everything he does we watched the watched the um, recording of the meeting which was in Hindi and he's, I mean, he's quite a character. I'd love to play the, the, the um, YouTube, but I don't have time, but I really recommend looking it up. The clip is on, um, you can find the clip on YouTube if you, if you type in Anilagawal, Bangalore, Zambia, you'll, you'll get it. And he's basically bragging to this big, the Jane International Trade Conference, this big room of other businessmen about all his successes of the company. And it's just this big section on Zambia where he talks about how he got the mine cheap, um, he takes, he makes fun of the um, Zambian prime minister at the time and how it's bringing him, you know, and how uh, he doesn't have to, to have any environmental standards. He makes the Zambian government pay for all the um, liabilities. And finally, he says, we took over the company. It has been nine years. And since then, it has been giving us a minimum of 500, 500 million dollars to one billion dollars. It has continuously been giving back. So he said every year we're making between 500 million dollars and a billion dollars which was out of the horse's mouth they're not making a loss so that video 
went viral it went everywhere you know we again we posted it and we accompanied it with a with a protest we used our contacts to to, to really get it out into zambia with, through press releases and it went everywhere this was the um, headlines on the zambian newspaper kcm owner mocks zambians and government and it went all across africa not just not just in zambia but all across africa and as you know the true face of these investors what they really say behind the scenes and how does this relate to other how many other mining companies are actually behaving like this so that led to um, a whole series of audits being done by the Zambian government. They had a technical audit committee and they also employed Grant Thornton to audit the company. And the audit turned up amazing things that Casey, basically that they, that the Redanti had asset stripped the mines, that all their claims of investment were false or they were much less than, than, um, than what the, co the company had claimed. They, they claimed they'd invested 2.6 billion and um, that was disproved that they'd actually even mortgaged, effectively mortgaged um, parts of the mine without asking the permission because the, the, the mine was is, is 20, well, no, it's not owned anymore. Now it's totally owned. It was 20.6% owned by the government through the government's investment arm. Um, so they should, they should have been asked about loans. They should have been involved in decisions about loans that were taken, but they hadn't been. The whole thing had been, had been mortgaged, basically been run into the ground. Um, and let me just see whether this is a good place to stop or not. Yeah, he also he also brags, and Alagwell also brags in that um, YouTube video about how he bought the mine for only twenty five million dollars when it was worth four hundred million. Um, okay, just say a couple more things, and then we'll have a little break. I see it's already okay. Um, so, so as a result of this, as a result of these audits, so you know, again, I think what's important to point out here is the Zambian government is not powerless. The Zambian government, you know, took matters into their own hands. They used every, all the resources they had to, when they got the information, to try and hold these companies to account. You know, we we have the idea in the West that Zamb that um, you know, African governments are either corrupt or incompetent. You know, nonsense. They're absolutely, you know, able to pursue their interests, but they need the information. And we were just able to give them the information that they needed to start their own process. So as a result of what came out in these reports, the government immediately withheld a whole load of VAT refunds, $600 million worth of VAT, VAT refunds that were due to the company. They withheld it straight away. We're not paying you that. And they raised the national um, mining tax from 0.6% was the mineral royalty tax for underground mining up to 9% and 20% uh, and from, sorry, yeah, and then up to 20% for um, open pit mining. So suddenly, you know, they, they said, well, you know, we've got to get something out of the, these companies that are bleeding us dry. Uh, oh, it's hard to know where to stop. Okay, I'll just take a little break here, otherwise I'll just go on forever and have another look at you all. Oh, I can't get out of this. Why can't I get out of it? Go away. Ah, there we go. Stop share. I'll stop sharing a minute and um, see if you've got any feedback. And then I'm going to speed up a bit with the latter section. So, anyone want to put any questions or anything they'd like to share at this stage? Just wanted to mention that I put on the chat a link to the Copper Colonialism Report from Foil Vedanta's website and a link to a Neil Agravel uh, speech. I can't remember if it is uh, transcripted, but that's where he brags about his um, his profits. It is, but you have to go to the captions. So when you when you watch it initially, it doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to have subtitles. But if you go to there's a little um, cog and you click subtitles, then they they come on. Shall I carry on, or does, does anyone want to say anything just now? Or are you are you zoomed out, or are you are you coping? I think carry on. Yeah, carry on. Okay. It's good to see you're still there. <laughs> right. I'll try not to go on for too long. Okay, let me just share my screen again. I mean, it would be nice uh, if you could uh, talk a little bit about the grassroots because you were talking about the links with the state as a result of action. But yeah, it all started with the grassroots links. We're coming to that. Yeah, yeah, we are coming to that. So how, how do you bring it back to the people that yeah, you Well, at, at this stage, we hadn't actually met the people yet, you see. That's why I'm sort of I'm telling it chronologically, but. Aha, uh -huh. 
Okay. Um, yeah, so just finally to say another interesting part of what was revealed by these audits, um, and also back, in fact, it was by another case, by um, another um, ar arbitration case, which happened in London between a uh, contractor of KCM and KCM, it, uh, it started to come out how they were showing showing a loss while actually making a profit, and which and, and which was by transfer pricing. So one aspect of it was transfer pricing, selling their copper to their own subsidiary in Dubai, uh, underpriced at much less than the actual value. So that that's another just interesting aspect. Aha, uh -huh. we won't talk about this now. We've already mentioned that. Aha. Uh -huh. So, um, so at this stage, we weren't even in touch with the communities who had. Um, who had taken this case, but we, we, the case for the pollution, but we knew that they'd never been paid. So, but we were in touch with these former miners th th who I showed you, those the, 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 the three or four people who were fighting for their pension. So I was constantly in touch with them on the phone and I said, look, we've got to find this, these people. We knew the name of the man who took the case. His name is James Nyasulu. Um, and I'll show you a picture of him. There he is, the James Nyasulu. And his committee and you know he lives in Chingola the, the miners lived in Kitwe. so I said to him you know could you go you know none of the NGOs had managed to get us any links to this guy but these poor you know very poor former miners living in Kitwe said could you find us this person he said yeah I'll, I'll, I'll find him for you so he went to keep to, to Chingola he asked people he asked people and he rang me to say I'm here now I'm standing here with James Nyasuli the man who who um who led this bottom-up case against Vedanta and he put me on the phone to him and that was the start of our relationship which was just on the phone for the first year or year or two years year I suppose and a bit um, we started liaising with them and, and hearing all about how their case had been corrupted how they weren't why they couldn't get to the higher courts they said they'd given up you know they'd it, it never been appealed the, the justice system kept making excuses that there weren't enough judges and they'd given up on, on ever getting justice so we started supporting them. We started doing protests. I think there's another protest there. No, that's later on. Yeah, we, we, we started protesting in the UK. We started campaigning on their behalf and basically it gave them hope. They'd given up hope, but it gave them hope that they could get justice. So they, start, they also started again approaching um, MPs and they actually approached the president of Zambia at the time, whose name was Michael Sata. He died not long afterwards possibly from poisoning, we'll never know, but that was one of the claims that was made. And he, again, as a result of the work that had started and, and, the, um, and the expose on, on the, the nature of Vedanta and KCM, he said, I'm gonna make sure your case is heard. And he personally intervened to make sure that the, the courts would hear their case. And it went through to the Zambian Supreme Court. It went through eventually to Zambian Supreme Court and they were, the, 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 the original judgment was upheld, the company was found guilty. However, in the period of going through to the Supreme Court, Michael Satter, the president of Zambia had died, um, who had really, you know, who'd been behind these communities at that point. And the compensation was basically removed. They said, we, we can't compensate everybody. We could only compensate you on a case by case basis and you have to provide medical, medical documents, which none of them had because all the surgeries in the, in the area were run by Vedanta, which is typical wherever Vedanta operates. They, you know, as part of their corporate social responsibility, they build medical centres, they take over medical centres, which means when pollution happens, they control, you know, the documentation around people's, people's medical health. So effectively, they were never compensated, although they did get justice, which was a very good start. Now, at this stage, and actually it was as a result of a talk that we gave about this issue at Sussex that um, a British law firm approached us. So, but by this time, we'd got the issue well into the international media. People were, you know, the international media was aware and it was out there that this pollution case had happened and they'd never been, they'd never got justice in Zambia. Um, and so we were approached initially by one law firm called Hausfeld PLC, and then later by another very famous law firm called Lee Day, who wanted to take the case because you know, this is what they do, they take human rights cases, they just not long ago won the case for the Mau Mau veterans in Kenya and they wanted to do a compensation case. So we, we started working with the first law firm that we were approached by, uh, the, the second one hadn't approached us yet, and we said, 
a compensation case isn't isn't the right thing to do. We should take a criminal case. There should be a criminal case against the management of this company. And they said, no way, it's not going to happen. You know, you we can't afford to fund it. A criminal case is just beyond. It's it's not possible. Um, compensation is the only thing that we can do. Get compensation for the victims. So we agreed that we put them. It's not our decision. You know, it's the community's decision. So we we put the communities in touch with the law firm. We told them about the risks of what we were worried about about a compensation case is that money will disappear. Firstly, money would, you know, if they get paid money, especially if they're communities who are not used to, and we've seen how poor these people were in Helen, if they're communities which are not used to um, having money, they often get approached by predatory lenders and, you know, and the money just disappears. Secondly, there'd be those who get and those who don't get, that could create divisions and stop them from actually being united to, to you know, to go for the justice that they need. And thirdly, it's the, it's the law firms who make the most money off these compensation cases. They make a huge amount of money. And, you know, that's a little bit of a conflict of interest. However, of course, the communities wanted some more justice. They wanted to go ahead with the compensation case. So we thought, okay, they, they, they were signed up and we wanted to get out. We thought we've got to get out there to, because we still haven't met all the communities. We just met this guy and his committee who are there, who's the one who, who, uh, led the case through the Zambian courts but we haven't met the communities yet and we want to do what we went to do which is share the information about the struggles in India connect them up with the global with the global movement give them information about the company um, and you know just support them to do what they need to do so we thought we've got to get back to Zambia again lack of funding we had to find our own um, we had to find our own means which we did once again however in the meantime before we'd got there the law firms had, had gone out. So the law firm that we'd initially worked with had gone out and then Lee Day had, had subsequently also gone out. Although we advised Lee Day, look, there's already one, one law firm working on it. Um, they went out nonetheless. And we heard from Yasulu, some terrible scenes ensued in the villages where the two law firms, these were these villages, super poor villages who nobody had come to help them with their, you know, with the pollution, nobody, no NGO had been to, to address their case. Suddenly there are rich Westerners turning up Law, law firms in big SUVs trying to sign them up two different law firms so some one law firms giving one offer one's giving another offer and at one point the two came together in a village and there was literally a kind of scuffle between the law firms so how disgusting you know to what a disgusting face to be presenting to to these communities who've been ignored for so long and suddenly they're being fought over because there's money there's there's money in these people there's there's money to be made by law firms so this was really horrifying and we thought we've got to get there to, to talk to them about the risks of, of the case, to make sure that they're well informed and to make sure that there's more to their struggle than just looking, you know, trying to get this compensation. Um, I'm not gonna play you. This is so, so we got out to Zambia. We went for a six week trip and we stayed um, again in the communities. We stayed with Nyasulu and one of his friends. We spent um, four weeks in Chingola and two weeks in, in the capital city um, on our very small budget, but we managed. And, you know, again, the advantage of having a very small budget is you are accountable to the communities because you depend on them. You know, you need them to let you sleep in their homes. So if they don't like your work, they're not going to put you up and, and look after you. So that makes you completely accountable to them and nobody else. And that's the way we're very happy to work, you know, and then we're really rooted in the communities, rooted with the people. We get to know them really well. And this is a testimony we took from amazing very very powerful speaker in one of the villages who talks about again you can look this up on youtube it, judith kaplumba if you just put that her name in she talks about the the long process they've been through the, the, the cases that they've taken in fact multiple cases they've taken when where there have been other pollution incidents by the company they'd already sued the company um on a small scale once or twice and then and, and then been part of this big bigger case that nyasulu took so you know what's important about this is yes you know they're victims of pollution yes they've lost everything and she talks about people literally dropping dead and her, that her legs don't work anymore because because of the acid that they're still consuming every day their crops don't grow you know they're just devastated by the pollution on a day on a day day-to-day -to -day basis because the pollution is continual then there's big episodes but basically it's continual but you see her strength and you see the action they've already taken they've already been in the court several you know multiple times so the strength is coming from the communities. <laughs> and um, and when we were visiting these, so we, we went around all these communities and we did speak to people and we spoke to them about the about what was happening in India and, 
um, and it was very it was very useful. On one occasion, the police turned up and we got arrested. And what was most shocking about that is it was an informant from one of the one of the legal so one of them say so these law firms had you know by now they'd got into the villages and they have local informants that they to make sure that nobody's interfering with their case basically. So one of their local informants sat in on our talk, very, very clear who he was. He was way wealthier than anyone else with a big bling watch, wouldn't really say who he was. Um, and and he was kind of watching us and made some phone calls and the police turned up and arrested us. So the irony of the, you know, the case which we had brought to brought to global attention, uh, uh, you know, in order, which had allowed the law, these, these human rights law firms to come, they were now arrested, getting us arrested because they didn't want us interfering in their, in their case, which, you know, we weren't, we weren't doing anything negative. We were just kind of, we were just sharing, trying to build the case, trying to make the case more successful by building activism around it. We were released. We were held all day in, uh, in the police station, but we were eventually released. But that was a real shocker. Um, and again, and, um, and, and yes, when we got to the, the capital city, we sh again shared more information on the, about the company that we had, tried to share as much information as possible. And, we leapfrogged all the way up in the end to the president of Zambia. So we were asked to advise the president of Zambia and his key advisors in State House, which was amazing. And we briefed them about everything we knew about the company, the fact that they definitely were uh, making a profit. Um, the president of Zambia turned to me, you know, this relatively young girl and asked me what he should do about the IMF, which I was, you know, <laughs> couldn't really believe, but I gave some sort of answer about solidarity with other third world countries. Um, so that was an incredible experience. And we, we, we said that we would stay in touch with them and, and share information with them. I'm aware that I've overrun my time, so I'd better stop um, and move on. So this is us having a, a meeting with, with the former miners. So we also, we continue to support these former miners who um, don't have their, didn't get their pension. So what, what's upsetting about the way the law firms came in, and it's the same way that NGOs come in, is they made it all about them. So this was a huge article in The Guardian about, about the case. When, so when this case came to the UK, which it did, and it's now been concluded and it's been won, um, they had these huge spreads in The Guardian. And this whole piece is all about how these, you know, is about the law firms basically swooping in and get, getting justice for people. At no point do they mention the name of Nyasulu, the, the, the cases the community had already been taking in Zambia, the, all the, you know, all the groundwork and the movement that exists in Zambia that had led to this point, they don't give any credit to it at all. So it, again, it paints Africans as victims who need white, you know, white rich people to come and save them from their plight. And to cut a long story short, the case went through the Zambian, the, the, the UK courts, their, their case for pollution. In the end, the Lee Day um, took the main case. They got the most communities on board. They took the main case and it went up through all the courts. And in the end, the house failed. The, 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 the villages, the villages were split between the two law firms. The villages that were in it with the other law firm joined on at the end. And what happened was this became a precedent case. It set, um, it set a precedent for, um, for subsidiaries, multinational company responsibility. So before this, the subsidiary of a British mining company, you couldn't sue the subsidiary of a British company in Britain. You could only sue them in the country where they operated. And this is what KCM was saying. You can't sue us in London because the pollution has happened in Zambia and the companies in Zambia. You can only sue in Zambia where they know they can corrupt the, the system. And this has always been the case. And many, many uh, cases have tried to break this law, this precedent before and none has succeeded, but this case did it. So it was it was huge institutionally, and and the Vedanta's lawyers' statement that they were said repeatedly is police this gateway. You've got to. They appeal to the judges. You've got to stop. There was five judges sitting in the case at this on the Supreme Court level. If you allow this case, they said to be won, then you're opening the floodgates to the victims of of British multinationals subsidiaries all over the world to come to come to the UK to get justice and the justice system can't cope and you shouldn't allow that and you've got to police this gateway and prevent that from happening. So it was a real, you know, you can see the establishment interests um, and this goes back to colonial links, you know, you can see how the colonial links that keep these offences at arm's length, but we won it, we won it. Justice Lady Chief Justice Lady Hale set a precedent um, and 
later an out of court settlement was done for for compensation but that this judgment has now opened the floodgates has opened the floodgates for other communities and the first ones to test it are the agoni that are affected by the by the oil spills in nigeria shell the shell oil spills in nigeria they're now coming back to the uk to get justice this is our protest outside with with liz is there who's listening in outside the supreme court amazing um amazing experience to listen to that case um, and subsequently, um, a few years later, well, in fact, in the same year, there were huge protests. By this time, KCM and Bedantra, obviously, their name was Mud in Zambia. And in the end, there were, again, grassroots protests came up in, in Chingola, where, to be honest, there isn't a lot. You know, one of the things that shocked us and, and upset us was the lack of grassroots movements in Zambia compared to in India, where grassroots movement is a way of life you know it's well understood and and people do move and struggle um in Zambia that wasn't the case and our analysis of this was that th that was because of the role of the church in silencing people keeping them well behaved keeping them you know, like good Christians and the role of NGOs which we saw firsthand how they how they tried to smother people's anger and and keep everyone in their place um, but you know it broke through and huge groups of people um particularly miners actually miners working for kcm because but by this point because kcm was being held to account but anta would kind of uh you know they, they got in more even more difficult they didn't they stopped paying contractors they stopped paying miners so there was more and more anger building and and, and after huge protests the government announced that they were axing vedanta as an investor and they took possession of the mine took possession of the mine again and to date Vedanta is kicked out of the country the case is going through the courts <clears throat> this is actually um a few days ago news from a few days ago the case is still stuck in the courts in Zambia but the doors are closing there's there's not, not many legal challenges left to Vedanta to try and keep KCM you know it's gone they're, they're, they're kicked out of the country but the sad thing is that what they've left behind is a totally depleted resource um with lots of liabilities lots of debt they've sold off all the best assets so you know now zambia needs to invest so much to get this mine you know um um you know up to scratch again but at the moment it's being run it's being nationalized it's being run by the by the country they are looking for another investor excuse me let me have a bit of water and i think that's almost all i have to say yes da -da 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 So again, what's you know the other thing that's a bit sad about the pollution case, um, the the case that that came to the UK is that they didn't help. Um, the the skills, the legal skills, and the <coughs> and the money, obviously, has all gone to these British law firms. They haven't built the Zambian justice system. In a way, they've even. Um, cemented the idea that the Zambian justice system isn't capable of holding these companies to account and it needs to come to the UK. So there, there are pros and cons to that. Obviously, these, these companies do need to be held to account in Britain, in, a, in the country where they make their money. But also, the Zambian legal system needs support. You know, it needs to be solidarity, not saviour complex or charity. Um, there's an article on our website about critical of NGOs, which was actually published in a journal, which if you're interested in, in our experience, which talks about Zambia, do have a look at it. This is just about London colonial era links and a suggestion for the role of the role of the DFID, the role of the, the CDC, the what was the Colonial Development Corporation in facilitating uh, Analog World's um, Vedanta's asset bleeding in Zambia. This is a meeting facilitated by the DFID between the president of Zambia, former president Michael Sata and Anna Nagawal, which uh, led to their possession. Okay, exit, click, exit. Hang on, let me go back to stop sharing. Yeah, so, you know, what's different? How we, how do we operate differently from NGOs? Is the last thing I want to say. We are not project led. You know, we don't, we don't um, carry out projects. We respond to emergencies. We respond to the news as it's happening. <laughs> We're accountable to the communities, not our funders. We question the need for self-publicity. Uh, um, so we always try to use our media opportunities when we have a protest or when, you know, when we're asked to speak to media, not to make ourselves known, but to give a platform to, to the grassroots people themselves. So we always try to link 
the media with, you know, speak to this person on the ground. We don't always say, or Miriam says, Sam Jadas says, Miriam Rose says, we don't, and we question the need, the assumed need for publicity and, and to get, to raise awareness by getting people to know about your struggle. We want people to know about the struggle on the ground, not about our work. And that also protects us, gives us security as well, because, you know, we're then not so known. Um, and we don't wait until an issue has coverage. We, we, you know, we go in when we hear about something, you know, when we hear about something happening, we go and try to contact the communities immediately. What NGOs do and what the law firms do, as you can see, is they wait until an issue is public and then, and then they go. So because that's how they can get funding. So NGOs won't, if you say to an NGO, oh, there's pollution happened here, you know, somewhere, or there's a human rights abuse oh well where's the media about it there's no media well then they can't get funding because they can't their funders want to see evidence that something's happened so NGOs methodology is that they wait until an activist group has made something uh, has made something public and then they come in and take over effectively or or you know add their own get involved with the struggle we go in at the start you know we we um yeah we 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 want to bring these things to attention, not wait until they already have attention. Right, I really better stop there. So uh, I think that'll do from me for now. Thank you. Um, thank you. It's fascinating. And there's so many questions, I'm sure. And I see that Liz is already raising her hand. So let's, let's open it for the discussion, please, Liz. I was actually um, applause, applauding. Um, uh, I just thought it was a great presentation. Um, oh. It's um, a really complex case and issue. Um, and even though I know a little bit more about it, I'm still learning. So um, yeah, it was great. Thank you. Maybe we should mention that Liz and Al uh, contributed to the campaign and then did an amazing banner. And when we stood in front of the Supreme Court, we were approached by so many people because the banner was so striking and it was yeah. saying it was painting the river Kafue and, and amazing, amazing uh, experience. Yeah, and, the image that, that I showed there. And, and another, just to say another important thing about being in those court cases was that the, the lawyers weren't sharing much information with the communities. So we wanted to be there in the, in the Supreme Court and in all the cases, well, A, for our own interest, because it's so important to hear what was going on, but also to feed back to the communities and tell them everything. You know, we want, they should have been there, but they couldn't be there. So we, we shared the whole, we wrote up everything that happened in the court. I even drew pictures of all the people, the, 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 the key players. So the communities would know, well, this is what, this is how you were discussed. And this is the facts that came out. And this is what the Levantes lawyer said. They have a right to that information, not to just be, treated as kind of clients to just be given money and you know uh it's their struggle so that was one of the reasons that we were there but yeah Liz and Al's contribution was fantastic really really appreciated you know for me I've just you know as I say I've got a one-year-old baby now so I've been out of activism really for the last two years because also while I was pregnant and um it was amazing for me to go through and remind myself of the story because it is incredible really how you know it amazes me how really you know a, a very small organization with no little to no funding could ev effectively change mining policy um in a country and lead to a company being expelled from that country and lead to a precedent court case being set in in the in the uk it wasn't all our work obviously there are many other people involved but our role bringing bringing the case bringing the whole situation to global attention and being in solidarity with the communities and also with not just the communities but with the politicians you know and that's another thing that NGOs find difficult they they can't be political we can be political we can work with a political party if we if if we want to um so we worked with everyone that we that we that, that we could and you know to to enable the change and we're still in touch we'll always be in touch you know we've made these people are friends i'll be in touch with those communities for the rest of my life i hope felix i see that you uh, unmuted yourself so are you asking a question no, i i have one question i'd love to ask and fantastic talk about fantastic work i i saw one slide you had about action aid and because you probably know, I really came across their duplicitous role in Neam Giddy. Mm -hmm. I, I missed what you were saying in that slide. I, I don't think you I, talked about it. Could you mention ActionAid? I didn't, yeah. So ActionAid are, are very active in Zambia. They were one of the um, 
one of the people that we we we, we met initially um action aids director there and told us that she she was actually quite good she said that because a lot of their funds were from diffid um diffid had told them not to interfere with british mining not to say too much about british mining companies in zambia to which she said i'm you know no i'm not going to listen to that so that was the first thing but the, the second thing is that that what that slide was saying is that you know again action aid are present in zambia but why haven't they gone to these they're an act they're meant to be an activist kind of based a development NGO why haven't they raised these issues in the communities why haven't they gone there and when you looked at, at the time I th she's probably still on there uh, uh, Action Aid's board of directors one of their board of directors and who's the director of the international of their finance um, who's a director of, fi of finance is Michael Lynch Bell who is a uh, who is a boss of, of Kazakh Mies. One of the one of the directors of Kazakh Mies, a very very dodgy mining company so they've got a key mining head sitting on Action Aid's board. So how can they critique mining companies? How can they, you know, how can they critique this whole system when they've got these people on their board? Um, so that that was what that slide was was about. But all of this information is in that article um, on our website, Northern Governmental Organisations between the free market and the nation state, which talks about the role of the role of NGOs as a buffer for capitalism is the way that we put it there, you know, in enabling a kind of the soft face of capitalism, enabling um, ex extractivism. Thanks. Yeah. Miriam, there was another detail about that NGO that was a, affiliated to Action Aid, describing people on, that sat on the land that KCM is yeah. for 30 years as what they were. Yeah, so that this was another, so this is about the kind of the, you know, God, there are so many critiques of NGOs, but this is about the structure of the way that they that they operate. So, you know, Action Aid is is present in Zambia, but ActionAid also has partner NGOs, small small local NGOs who they, you know, I suppose the way they would see it is they're they're trying to build, um, they're trying to, um, you know, build up these small NGOs to 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 be able to deal with local issues. Uh, so this local NGO had had written a report about pollution by KCM, another kind of pollution. They dumped a whole load of. Um, mine waste not not toxic mine waste but like rub but rubble and gravel all over all this farmland and the report was their investigation into you know in, into this issue and the, the conclusion of the report was well the people living on the land um were squatters they didn't have actual land papers so they may have, they may well have had you know had uh, rights to that land but they didn't have the title papers therefore they're considered squatters so the conclusion was that the mining company should remove squatters or and or put up notices to prevent squatters because then there won't be complaints from people about this kind of dumping <laughs> so no solidarity with the people you know with with the farmers with the people affected and really a shocking conclusion so we took this to the action aid head in zambia and said and said how can you sponsor an organization that's that's who are who are on the side of the mining companies who who are publishing a report like this and they said oh they were supposed to send the report to us and then we were going to write the conclusion in for them so you know the, the process is broken down which is even more revealing so you know how are you empowering these local ngos if you're just you know you're basically editing and writing their report for them so and then that was just another example of the kind of mess the absolute mess of the way ngos are operating there and the huge waste of money the huge amount of resources that goes in goes into them and I'm, you know i don't want to discredit all ngos and as we say in our in our report there is obviously a role for solidarity. We need organisations to go and be in solidarity with people, but it needs to be real solidarity. It needs to be information sharing. It needs to be on, a, on an equal basis. And it is our hope. And there are some good NGOs out there, of course, um, but not a lot. And it is our hope that NGOs can take this feedback and that they can change and be more truly in support, in support of communities. I mean, it will be interesting to hear from uh, people that we haven't heard. Uh, if you are either a student or working in the uh, or a lecturer, and if you're involved in any work that links or touches the issues, uh, it would be interesting to hear your perspective about uh, Miriam's uh, story. Also, there is a message from Klausin, who is from Zambia. Maybe oh. somebody can read out the chat from him. Oh, I'd love to hear from you, Klausin. Is it in the chat? Okay, let's see. Shall, shall we read it? Oh, sorry. Hi, Hi, I'm 
Go on, you read it. Yeah. Hi, I'm Klausin and I'm Zambian from Kitwe. You know, compensation is not enough as this doesn't improve the environment. The key is to impose certain law principles, um, such as the polluter must pay principle in Zambia by putting pressures on the government law and policy on the government law and policy makers to put these principles into effect as i have learned in the uk mm -hmm. there is a weakness in this area in zambia and i took forward to when i look forward to when these movements will make a breakthrough i don't know much about environmental law but i feel compensation alone is not enough polluters need to take responsibility and remove the pollution, additionally, reduce or change the way they dispose of their pollution. Thank you, Klaus, because you brought up something that I meant to say, which is that basically our fears have been realized. You know, that, like I said, that the reason we didn't want to have a compensation case is we were worried that it wouldn't leave them any better off. The communities would be paid money, but their site would be just as polluted. They'd still be living on polluted land. They wouldn't be resettled. Um, and therefore, nothing would have changed five years later or, or worst case scenario. It would they'd be worse because they'd be divided by the fact and divided and and. Um, saddened you know by by the fact that they'd that some had received money and others hadn't and yes lo and behold and ultimately and that's the way these law firms operate they do they always end in out of court settlements so we, we don't know yet we will find out but officially we don't know um how much has been paid to um to each claimant we do know that we know by experience that the law firm will have earned more for each claimant than the claimant gets um but as far as we know so far, well, we, we do know, um, pollution cleanup has not been part of, the, of, of what was negotiated because we said all along to the communities, you must, you must make sure that as well as com financial compensation, that the land is remediated if it can be, and if it can't be, that you're resettled, you need to be resettled. Again, the problem is most of these people are squatters. They don't have um, land titles, but you know they've lived on that land for a long time. They should be resettled to somewhere clean, land should be remediated, and of course, and cleaned up the whole river. Um, you know, the, the, the company stopping polluting has, in, in, in the Zambia situation, as you know, um, that's no longer an issue because Vedanta are no longer there. However, there have been pollution incidents already under the, under the Zambian government's um, takeover of the mine, but that's because the whole mine is so run down that there needs, there's a huge amount of work to be done to prevent pollution from happening. But you're absolutely right, you know, so while, um, while I do celebrate, the, we do celebrate the victory because it has, it, it, is, it is changing, it will change the way mining companies operate if they know that they can be taken to court in the country where they make money. You know, if, if, if British, British miners know that they can now be, be held to account in Britain, it will prevent them from, it will make them think twice about polluting as much, it makes their risks much higher. However, in terms of the communities, they may they may end up no be, no better off ultimately, and that is absolutely tragic. And you know, we're sad that we weren't able to build a bigger movement there, to you know, to demand those those results. But um, basically, to put it bluntly, you know, the communities were very afraid of protest. They had no history of protest. They were very afraid of the repression. And that was what we wanted to build up. We wanted to link them with the Indian communities who know how to protest, who've had these victories and build up their ability. But because of the interference of the law firms, we, it was difficult for us to be there. It was difficult because they'd already decided that the law firm was the law, the, the British case was going to solve all their problems. And the law firms had told them, don't let anyone else into your community. So we were not as welcome. We were welcome, but there was a bit more they were unsure because already these other white people had turned up in Land Rovers, you know, claiming that they were going to save them. So it was then complicated to explain who we were and that actually we know about their case way before the law firms did. Uh, so it was a, basically the law firms created a bit of a mess in the communities and, and that mess is, is ongoing. But, you know, we're, we're still in touch and, you know, hopefully through the Zambian government that those people can be resettled. I think that's that's the hope for them now. But Klausin, I don't know, presumably you um, are living in the UK, but um, um, hopefully you'll go back to Zambia and address some of these issues because there are some amazing people, particularly in the Zambian Revenue Authority. There are some amazing people who 
who um, who have held this company and others to account now, and who are who are responsible for the divorcing of Vedanta and also for changing the mineral royalty. Okay, there is uh, problems there as well, but there are some amazing people in Zambia who are trying to address these issues, and hopefully, you'll go back and be part of that whole movement. Yeah, I'm currently in the UK and I'm really, really hoping that I can contribute something to my country and help different communities uh, do, get what they deserve and not being taken uh, for granted by these big firms who have who, can, who only speak with money and not with uh, the mind properly. So I really hope I can contribute something in the future when I go back. Well, um, please stay in touch if you're interested to be in touch, Klaus, and we can put you in touch with some of the people in Kitwe, you know, and, and, the, and the communities if, if you want to, you know, follow up some of this work. I'd, I'd love, to, love to be in touch with you. So I can share my um, email address in the chat. That would be amazing. I would love that. Thanks. Okay, I'll do that now. Um, I'm a Zambian as well. And in Lusaka, and the information that you've given us today has just made me rethink my whole perception of NGOs in the country. Usually, we look towards them as being like these organizations that bring in money from, like, uh, for example, Holland. I know of particular NGOs. It's it's very depressing. I'm not gonna lie, um, to realize that they don't have the community's best interests at heart sometimes. I was wondering, like, how did you start with the grassroots movement? How do you get the funding um, and the interest to be able to actually settle yourself in Zambia and to create something? Because, like, for us, we usually just think of the NGOs as being the only path to take. Exactly. That's exactly why I wanted to tell this story, so that, you know, to, uh, to say that there is another way. I mean, I don't know if you missed any of the talk, but that's kind of what I was talking about. You know, you don't need huge resources to go to the communities. Just go there. You know, they're, they're just they're, they're people just like us. You know, just just go there and uh, and meet and meet people. You know, find local contacts. Um, just talk talk to people and go to those places. Start documenting it. Start asking. Start listening to people. Start asking them what their problems are. Help them to um, you know get to address the powers that they need to address, but don't, don't co-op their struggle, don't take it over, but support them. You know, it really is a case of just being a, being a human being, being, having a human to human interaction with people and, and listening, but it, you've got to be willing to do it without funding. That's, that's the difficulty. And it is a difficulty because not everyone can afford to volunteer their time. Um, and that's what we've, we've, we've done. You know, I, I work, I do separate paid work and I use my spare time. I work part time, I use my spare time to do activism and I'm able to do that. I'm privileged to, to be able to do that. That's, that's a sacrifice. Yeah. In terms of not having a full time paid job, but it's so rewarding. So you've got to be prepared to do the voluntary work and, and speak the truth, not be afraid to say things that are difficult. Um, not be afraid to challenge um you know challenge people like the law firms you know i got we got a lot of comeback from challenging the law firms but we had to speak the truth about what they've done in the communities you know we can't um uh, be silent about it um while we, we recognize some of the benefits to what they've done so um yeah there there, there really are other ways but it, it and and i think look to look to the grassroots movements that are all over the world you know the, the neem giri talk i'm sure will be inspiring as well and um, take inspiration from them. You know, if people, if, if, if uh, you know, indigenous people can stop a mining company from mining their mountain, then we as, as uh, students and relatively privileged people can, can do an awful lot. And I think the other important thing is that those of us who have, who, who are, have been to the UK or have university education, we have a duty. That's the way Sam Render has always spoken about it. And I agree. We've received the education. We have a duty then to take that to the people who can't afford it and we have access to information. London is an absolute mine of, of information on these mining companies. So, you know, get the financial information, go to the British Library, um, do some background work, read all their annual reports and take that information and share it with, and share it with, with people. You know, that's our responsibility really as people who have a link to the West is to share the information that NGOs are not sharing with these with communities. May I add, uh, Nadia, a few uh, 
words to what Miriam described so well. I think that there's a lot of knowledge behind the intervention, and this knowledge is very well researched. It's a teamwork. So even though it could be concentrated by one person that gathers the information and put it together and you know, synthesize it, a lot of people are involved in, in analyzing and a lot of reports from things that, that other people may think are boring, like uh, stock market reports or company uh, annual uh, report. So, so there are resources there, that, and it it needs a team to uh, to do that. So, if you can get a team together and get those skills that are usually uh, feeding market analysts, so you could earn millions and millions of pounds from this information, and instead you just go to the communities and give it to them, to the leader, and to law firms, and actually undo some of the harm. Because actually, what you, what you uh, describe, Miriam, is actually prompting the prompting the state to do its job and giving it tools and information to to do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and you, you're, you're right. There's a lot of background research, you know, and I, and I have to credit Samarendra, and that's really his, you know, what he's he's an amazing researcher, and you know, he, he digs up really interesting revelatory information which needs to be shared. And that's not everyone's, you know, skill, but it's very useful. But I think if you if you go to any community, um, you know, who's suffering any human rights or environmental abuse with somebody with a bit of legal experience, somebody with a bit of um, um, journalist experience, somebody with a bit of um, economic experience, you know, as students, we can gather people with a, with a few of those skills. You can you can help a huge amount. You can analyze the situation and with the skills that you have and get the information that they need. So yeah, I think getting a team together and going to support any community is extremely valid and important. Felix, maybe you could say a word about reverse anthropology because you were mm -hmm. quite instrumental to tell the story of Niamgiri to the world. You're muted again, Felix. You unmuted, then You're you mute again. <laughs> I, I, I was just saying, I don't feel that's needed here now. I mean, to complement what we, what um, Miriam has said, I mean, in a way, it's the same principle, but in more an academic context of really being guided by communities and reversing the gaze on the institutions that are exercising power, including anthropologists, including academics, including governments, agencies, including NGOs, to, to reverse the gaze instead of analyzing the already often subjugated other, to, to, to draw on those people's perceptions to, to analyze those with power. That, that's all that reverse anthropology is. So uh, you're, you're talking about an actual case of doing that in a way with, um, with communities in, in activism, in pure activism. At, at its best. And we've and, and you know building on that, we, we've always tried to be careful in our reports and, and in our talks. In fact, I've not done very well on that today, to not to be tempted, as it's very tempting to do, to to show the faces of lots of victims, of lots of people, you know, lots of uh, communities, and how how affected they are by you know by human rights abuses or pollution, and show their you know show their injuries, or show their wounds, or show their sad faces, but but instead to show the, the faces who are doing this to them, you know, expose the, because we've all seen those, we've all seen those faces of, of, you know, poor people and what's been done to them. What we don't see is their strength, you know, actually the, the fighting that they all do, they all fight, they're all fighting back. They're not waiting to be helped. And also we don't see the faces of the people who are really behind those other interests. So let's, instead of showing, you know, victims, let's show the faces of the finance, financiers who know, whose name nobody knows and the faces of, um, you know, the MPs and the faces of um, the deal fixers who get the deals done. Those are the faces that we should be getting to know and, 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 and associating with these abuses, not just victims. So that's, I suppose that's extending your reverse, that's building on your reverse yeah, anthropology method. Yeah. It would be interesting to hear if anyone that hasn't spoken yet uh, would like to say something. 
no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. And one and a half hours on Zoom is already a lot. So, so just to apologize if there's a gap here, sorry for not attending, Miriam. Thank you so much for coming, you know, and absolutely amazing what you just said about showing the faces of the perpetrators rather than showing the faces of the victims. I think that's absolutely what Samreva and you have been doing. So hats off. Thanks. And, 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 and highlighting what's what's happening and, and, and naming and shaming. I think that's what we need to do. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Yeah. So just to give you a little bit more of an update about Vedanta and another thing that happened yeah. subsequently is that, because um, I didn't talk about the bigger picture of Vedanta, is that as a result of this case and, and other and, and another major incident that, I mean, Viniti, you know this already, that happened in um, Tamil Nadu where 13 people were shot by police in a protest against Vedanta. Um, and we, we, there were a huge amount of protests in London with the, the Tamil community and ourselves and others. Um, they eventually left London. They, were, they finally became afraid that they might be held to account in London um, by the authorities, although they probably wouldn't have been. But anyway, they made a decision to delist from London and they're now trying to delist in India. So they've come under so much pressure. Most of their operations are closed. They're still borrowing money like crazy and trying to acquire and, and inflating themselves to look like a worthy mining company, but they're in a lot of trouble. And they've, they're basically trying to go private because, because to, to get out of the public gaze so that their AGMs will no longer be public, so that they won't have uh, be subject to so many regulations. Um, and so they're trying to take themselves out, the, out of the public eye. But they're, you know, they're they're really, they're really suffering. <laughs> they've really um, been affected by activism. Basically, they've they, they've been taken down by activists all uh, wherever they operate. And now there are the focus now is in India because because most of their operations are now in India, and there's no there's no company in London for us to protest against anymore. So uh, there are a series of legal cases happening in India. Uh, 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 almost all of their operations run by really interesting young lawyers. Um, and most of those cases have, have, have been successful. So it's very good news. And you can, if you're interested to know more about the company, you can check our Facebook page, Boyle Vedanta Facebook page is, is constantly updated with information on, on the company and also other, other interesting posts about um, extractivism, finance, you know, mining finance and other related issues. I'd like to add that uh, our talks are part of the of this Climate Justice Week organized by the Student Union, with the intention not only to raise awareness and to link students to that are basically academic work to uh, the world of active <laughs> environmental activism, but I think that there, re there is a real need. There's a there's a gap. There's missing platform, global platform to coordinate environmental uh, movement, the, the world environmental movement into an effective force. And I don't know how many people were around in between 2000 and 2010 in activism, but if you remember in 2000, the, the Jubilee campaign, the Drop the Dead campaign, uh, Make Poverty History in 2004, so there was a global movement that basically connected anyone that thought that the world is not working well and need repair into a platform that was just enabling these conversations going on and pressure on governments and whenever there was a G7 or G8 meeting or G20 meeting or NATO meeting or European Union uh, convention, there was a pressure put by all the whole world of uh, protests to push the governments to do, to make the world better. Um, and we were plunged into the Iraq war with big uh, movement uh, trying to stop it. We were plunged now into COVID and now it's in the, the space of actual intervention is not there yet. So I, uh, if you read the introduction to the Climate Justice Week that the Student Union put uh, uh, on their page, there is a, a desire and, and let's say the aim is to achieve this kind of national and international coordination of environmental activists and the environmental movement to be an effective power force that will push the government of their countries to, to the direction that we, we believe is, is the right one that brings justice to the majority of people and to those communities that are affected by pollution and 
um, and and and, uh, and and maltreatment that uh, Miriam just uh, described. So this is a one case study, but we would like it to shed light on the world of extractivism, not only of metals. It could be knowledge, people, oil, water. So um, we definitely feel committed to it in the Center for World Environmental History to uh, be an activist scholarship uh, in this uh, context. Just could I just say one thing, Zuki? We've just circulated uh, Manan Ganguly's um, uh, Ekta Niketan report, which is on uh, extractive industries and TB. Uh, very high rates of um, uh, TB among in, uh, Adivasi communities in uh, Jharkhand. So there is a report that's being circulated to CWH through CWH networks, which are, it's just makes for very very moving reading. So. Manan Ganguly is cited in the report. So the links between disease and extractive industry is something that we are trying to push and highlight as part of this campaign more widely. And Manan's um, network is quite important for that. So if anyone is interested, I can link you up with that, uh, with Manan, yeah. Thank you, Vinita. So that is through the Center for World Environmental History website. Yeah, yeah. So there is a yeah, but he he the, his organization has been there working in that area for a long time. He himself is a doctor and has and has been working among the the communities for a long time. But he he has really documented the links between silicosis and all sorts of different ailments with um, uh, with uh, particular forms of extraction in in Jharkhand. Yeah. Mm. Thank you.